I'm honored to be here with the pride of Canton, Illinois, but he's a lifelong Illini. Dave Downey, welcome to RBI. How are you? Well, thank you. I'm great. I'm better than I deserve, that's for sure. Well, you know what? You're better than most, and certainly in Illini Nation, uh, you know, you had the, the privilege of playing the very first game in what is now the State Farm Center. But I think I can say this is the house that you helped build because we're sitting here in Club 53, which uh, signifies your 53-point game against Indiana. It was in Bloomington, right? Right. It was not here, but the uh, all-time single-game scoring record in Illinois basketball history. Now you sit here as uh, one of the great uh, pillars of the Illini Nation, a philanthropist, uh, a great supporter of Illinois athletics. Uh, just when you sit here at this at this renovated State Farm Center, how do you reflect on your career, which started as a great basketball player, uh, as a board of trustee member, you know, supportive athletics, and now uh, as, as someone who's considered to be kind of one of the, on the Mount Rushmore of uh, Illinois basketball? Well, Mount Rushmore, that means a hard head, right? <laughs> well, I actually have been very fortunate in my life, and the reason that I agreed to do something relative to the Club 53 was to have something without my name on it because it's a team game. And I benefited from Manny Jackson and Governor Vaughn, mm -hmm. Jerry Coangelo. Those were there here when I got here. I learned from them. And particularly, I think, from Gov because I had to play him every night in practice. He taught me to play like a man. And that was really important to me. And when we now talk about Manny and Jerry and myself, we argue about who was poorest when we were kids. <laughs> but, but now you argue who's the richest. <laughs> There's no argument about that. I'm not in that league. <laughs> you're, not in, you're not in that, uh, in that discussion? In no. That not. <laughs> but, but you're all in the millionaires club, so that's pretty good. Well, it's, we've been very fortunate. If you had Tal Brody, yes. who is a genuine ambassador from the state of Israel, yes. there are people in that era who were really important to me. And that's why we're going to have a picture of the team and some of the words about what happened during that era because that was what made me happen anyway and I think made it possible to do this. And in so many ways, it's, uh, that's one of the, the building blocks of Illinois basketball. You can go back to the Wiz Kids in, in the 40s, but it, y your era ushering in the 60s, of course, in 1963, winning the Big Ten Championship. And you mentioned a lot of your teammates and, and guys you played with and all have gone on to do great things in life and in business. You in particular, what's interesting about your story, you were a licensed insurance agent while you were still a student here playing college basketball in 1962, is that right? That's right, I got started in 62 and never- The NCAA looked. didn't have a problem with that? Well, yes, <laughs> I couldn't get paid during the school year. I worked during the summer and a little bit at Thanksgiving, a little bit at Christmas, and then, but I didn't get paid any time during the school year. You feel like you got, you got a raw deal on that one? No, I got paid later. They, <laughs> they kept it for me. They, they held it for you. Uh, that's very rare to hear, a, you know, about a big-time college athlete with the, the foresight and the mindset to say, you know what, I'm going to start preparing for my career after basketball, off the court, while I'm still playing. How did you get the, the idea to say, hey, you know what, I see a future in insurance. This is what I'm going to start doing now. Well, I, I was fortunate. I made a lot of good guesses as a kid. I don't know that any of them were smart. I just were mainly lucky. And I, I knew in that era there wasn't any real money in professional basketball. And I had some good assistance in learning that. I was involved with, the, the, went down and tried out against Lenny Wilkins. Mm. And they, at the St. Louis Hawks. I was going to say St. Louis Hawks. Yeah, they had. It's a really good team. But. Well, they had regional, right, because big, the big, NBA was not such a big deal. So I went to there and they said, Lenny Wilkins would say to me, I'm gonna go buy you on your right. He was left-handed and I couldn't stop him. <laughs> so I decided that maybe what I better do is work with my head instead of my body because I wasn't gonna be good enough to be good. Now, how did that humble you though when you had this, you were an All-American here at Illinois, three-time All-Big Ten player and then you go to this level and you feel like, you know, you're one of the scrubs. I mean, did that, how did that affect you mentally? Well, it made me think that I ought to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> you figured the round ball wasn't going to feed your family, huh? Well, and, and actually, a, a number of the people that were there said, if you can do something else, go do it, because people who can only play, and there are only eight teams in the league, mm. 
they they would kill to keep their uniform. I mean, mm -hmm. because that was their life. And that was it. And for me, it wasn't. I, in fact, when you mentioned the Indiana game, that allowed me to quit. I mean, I, you were something of an athlete when you were younger. Mm -hmm. You always think if I could have done it once more, I would have gotten it right. I got it right. And you dropped the mic and I'm done. It was like <laughs> exit stage left, uh, I'm done. <laughs> and it's right. true, everywhere you are, it's true. You need to know when you've reached your peak. Mm. And if you don't need to do it anymore, don't do it. I enjoyed playing pickup games in Huff at the MPO as much as I enjoyed playing in Madison Square Garden. You loved the game, the competitiveness was still there, but you didn't need to make it a part of your identity. Right, and it was really, you know, I was talking to my wife the other day about dancing, and I said, playing a, a basketball game at times was like that because you could soar. Mm. And you could get outside yourself, and I can remember. And that's a great thing about athletics. I think it's also a great equalizer with human beings. Why has it been so important for you to continue to support Illinois athletics, uh, basketball specifically, but just in a, in, a, in a broader sense, in a larger sense, the entire program and the university? Why, why has that been so important to you? Well, I, because they were good to me. Mm -hmm. If Without the university, I probably would have been working in Canton, Illinois in a coal mine. Mm -hmm. my, father, my dad couldn't read or write. We never had indoor plumbing until I was a senior in high school. So this allowed me to achieve something. And so to give back seemed to be the only right answer. And this is a great community. It's a great institution. And we have had great people go through here more than just in athletics, but we've had some great athletes. And you've been here for the good times and, and some not so good. And you still believe that Illinois is great and can, can sustain greatness, and, and you're here to support that, right? Well, I'm definitely here to support it, but the sustained greatness is more than just athletics. But, That's right. But we can be really good in athletics. We're not going to be the best year after year on everything we do. We can't be. And why do you say that? Well, because the comp competition is fierce. Mm -hmm. There are good people out there and good players, and the, the one and done or the two and done kind of thing is very different from what it used to be. And I would say that that is a problem for college mm -hmm. athletics. We need to still emphasize that athletics is a way to get somewhere else in life, not an end in itself. And that's so true. And I'm glad you brought that up because this is a great institution of higher learning. You're here to get a world-class education that can springboard you to a great life and, and generational changing um, you know, uh, opportunities that you'll get from the University of Illinois. Uh, you've had several athletes come behind you. One in particular pops up, Jerry Hester, who works for your company. Uh, how do you counsel uh, athletes who come along and they all believe they're going to be first round picks or play 15 years in the NBA, but everyone's not going to be Darren Williams or Kendall Gill. What about the athletes who come through here? H how do you help them make sure they know, hey, you better take advantage of these wonderful opportunities you have here at U of I. Well, I, I talk with them. I'm available. I don't intrude in people's lives, mm. but I have one in particular I think about now, a young man that was a local. His father's a lawyer. His dad asked me to talk with him. He's a quarterback. He was a high school All-American. Mm. And when we parted, I said, you remember, you're just one ACL mm. away from being a normal student. <laughs> Now, he tore the ACL, he redshirted. He may be a great quarterback, but he's a great student. He's planning to start the law school after three years here. So it, it's the kind of thing that we had the opportunity to get a great education and make great contacts. Uh, Jerry, you mentioned, is well thought of in Chicago. Mm -hmm. People like him. In fact, I kid him. I said, they like you a lot better than they like me. <laughs> And he's prettier than I was, too. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> but it was, for me, I always thought that athletics was a way to get a great education. And if you, I believed in education. If you get an education, you got a chance. Without it, you don't. You have no shot. And today, you know, as you mentioned, I've been involved in education and in civil rights my entire lifetime. That if I could run the world, I would teach young kids to read. And if they learn to read, they can dream. And that's what happened with me. I listened, it was before television was very popular, to Chick Hearn do Bradley basketball. Mm -hmm. 
and I used to dream that I would be 6'4", 200 pounds, introduced in Madison Square Garden. A dream carried me through to the point where I begged my dad to get me a hoop. He couldn't afford one. He made me one. He made it a little too small. It's now in the center of my man cave to remind me that my dad cared enough to make this hoop. He didn't know anything about basketball. But the reason you're talking to me today is that hoop was a little too small. Well, Chick Hearn, the late great Chick Hearn would say the, the eggs are in the icebox, the jello's jiggling, <laughs> and everything's cooling. But we got a lot more coming up with Dave Downey. Uh, this is part one, but stick around to have much more coming up in part two with Dave Downey here on RBI. <laughs>